Hey, Steph listeners, hear about the latest trends in the travel industry with the brand USA Talks Travel Podcast. Right now, listen to special live from IPW interviews featuring U.S. Travel's Jeff Freeman. DMOs are at the heartbeat of U.S. Travel. Liz Bittner from Travel South. A lot of key gateway markets are back. L.A. Tourism's Adam Burke. We all win when we all partner together. Plus, brand USA's Stacey Melman and Jackie Ennis with international travel trends and Chris Thompson's farewell finale. I'm Mark Lapidus. Join us for brand USA Talks Travel on your favorite podcast platform. Brand USA Talks Travel. News broke this morning that Choice Hotels announced a public offer to acquire Wyndham Hotels and Resorts. This is after months of discussion between the two companies and Choice, after being frustrated with Wyndham's decisions to end talks last month, today laid an acquisition offer rather publicly on the table. This was pretty exciting in itself, with the last major M&A deal in the hotel industry being the Starwood Marriott merger back in 2015. However, there's even more to the story. Further on in the day, more news broke that Wyndham rejected Choice's offer and saw its stock being halted on the New York Stock Exchange. Are we covering Twitter here or the relatively stable hotel industry? I'm Pranavi Agarwal, Senior Analyst at Skift Research, and in this podcast, I'm going to ask all my burning questions about Wyndham versus Choice to the experts, Sean O'Neill, Senior Hospitality Editor at Skift, and Alan Boynsky, Editor of the Daily Lodging Report. Hello. Hello, Pranavi. So it's been a it's been a long saga in the Wyndham and Choice battle, and a lot has happened today in itself. So I'm going to pass the floor over to Alan, who's going to summarize it all for us. Over to you, Alan. Okay. Well, since this is such a fluid situation, and there are a lot of stale media reports on this, let me just summarize what's happened so far. All right. First, back in April, Choice first made the approach to buy Wyndham at eighty dollars a share. And that was consisting of 40% in cash and 60% in choice stock. Wyndham rejected the offer and then refused to engage in any further discussions. Choice didn't seem to understand that and came right back with an $85 a share offer that was 55% cash and 45% choice stock. That at least brought Wyndham to the table to negotiate. But for right now, it doesn't look like anything is happening with that. Choice gave Wyndham what they said was their best and final offer of $90 a share, which consisted of $49.50 in cash and 0.324 shares of Choice stock for every Wyndham share owned. That meant it would be 55% cash and 45% Choice stock. According to Choice in their press release today, after some more discussions and an offer from them to enter into a non-disclosure for due diligence, Wyndham broke off talks. Today, Choice went public with everything, clearly showing that they now want to take this to the shareholders and potentially a proxy battle. While Choice Hotel's shares fell, that effectively brought the offer down to about $87 a share in value, but Wyndham's stock did not even get to $78.50 a share in regular trading. Later in the morning, Wyndham's stock was halted and the company issued a formal press release confirming they rejected the offer with reasons including they felt there was too much risk in Choice Hotel's stock, making up such a big portion of the deal, and Wyndham's belief that it could take a long time for regulatory approval. That also led to their concerns about franchisee churn, and probably the root of their rejection, they felt the deal undervalued Wyndham's future growth potential, undervaluing their stock, while at the same time, they made it clear they believe Choice's shares were fully valued. So that's where we are right now. The good news is the hotel sector is back in the spotlight, but I can tell you for sure that this has a long way to go before coming to a resolution. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. Um, Perhaps you can just take a step back and try and really understand why Choice is trying to acquire Wyndham in the first place. And I guess perhaps from a naive point of view, the first question I had was, why is it that Choice is trying to acquire Wyndham rather than the other way around? You know, Wyndham has a larger room count, it is more international, it's got a more diverse chain scale mix, it's got higher EBITDA margins and EPS growth post-COVID, but it trades at a discount to choice despite all of that. So what are the power dynamics at play here? Well, I think you have a couple of things at play here. First, the combined companies would effectively have 50% of the economy segment. 
And, it's, and Hilton is showing with their new Spark brand that this is an underfollowed and potentially underpenetrated segment. Choice also feels the combined reward programs would compete, could compete against Hilton Honors and Marriott Bonvoy. And the combined companies would pretty much be everywhere you need a hotel room. Whether Choice's acquisition of Radisson had anything to do with their fascination with Wyndham, I really don't know. On the other hand, like you said, Wyndham was trading at a discount to Choice. And when one company has a higher valuation, they look to buy someone Wall Street is not recognizing. Yeah, and I would echo what Alan just said there. I think it's a fascinating question, Pranavi. Um, you know, in August, you did a report for Skiff Research subscribers, Wyndham versus Choice, and you highlighted several of those dynamics there that Wyndham is very competitive uh, on a bunch of fronts. Um, but Choice, as Alan just said, has kept sort of an earnings power premium relative to Wyndham for a few years now. Um, and investors have given a higher market capitalization for Choice for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, Patrick Scholes at True Securities is attributed partly because Choice is, is, is doing better at net unit growth. <clears throat> and investors like the idea that Choice is adding more hotels to its system relatively faster uh, because it, it's marginally more earnings for every it, you, that you get per every hotel added. And so investors like that. Um, investors also like the perceived attractiveness of Choice's brands to Wyndham's. Um, and they infer that because Choice's brands uh, tend to have an average higher revenue per available room uh, than Wyndham's comparable brands do. Uh, and then lastly, as uh, Alan just sort of alluded to, Choice sort of has a stronger balance sheet, relatively speaking, um, thanks uh, to a combination of free cash flow and its debt. And so all of that is one of the reasons that have supported Choice having a higher stock price. And because it has that higher stock price, relatively speaking to its overall performance relative to um, to Wyndham, uh, that that enables it to make an, a a a takeover bid that has a stock based comp, comp component to it. So, so I think that's the explanation. Even though Wyndham has made a little bit more revenue last year than Choice last year, um, Choice still has sort of an upper hand. Yeah, I think I just want to touch on something that Alan said, and I'll direct this to you, Sean. So Alan said that um, in his introduction that Wyndham might have been concerned that regulatory approval would take too long if uh, this acquisition did go through. And, you know, in recent news, we have seen that attempted acquisitions such as Booking trying to buy eTraveli, that's been rejected on the basis of antitrust concerns. Is that a concern for hoteliers like Wyndham and Choice? Uh, they both have roughly 9% share of the U.S. market. That combined would be an 18% share, which would make them bigger than the current market leader, Marriott, which is about 16% share. Um, is that a concern to you at all? So I think it's an important point to raise. Uh, partly it depends on when. So at, because both of these companies are so primarily exposed to the North American market, it's the U.S. regulatory area that matters the most. And so if if this deal goes fast enough that the current administration is uh, <clears throat> uh, reviewing it, then they might run into more headwinds. If if it takes longer and there's a new administration, then it might go easier. Um, you pointed out in your Skiff Research Report on Wyndham versus Choice, um, you did a comparison of the market share of the major hotel groups, and you looked at the mix of hotel chains by chain scale. for and, and on two, Let's look at two areas where they're particularly strong. I mean, mid-scale, you said the choice had 36% of the mix of all the major brands in the US and Wyndham had 25%. So together they'd have a majority of the mid scale. And in economy, you said that Wyndham had about 32% and choice had about 14%. So it'd be nearly a majority. There's other ways of measuring it. Other analysts look at you know the number of total room count uh, and similarly you'll get to very high figures. So um, I think it is something that might uh, raise the eyebrows of some people at DOJ in the Biden and the Biden administration. Uh, but again, the choice uh, has argued today in its materials that it believes it's a competitive deal uh, because it's a bigger it's a it's a bigger picture. This is about more than just budget versus hotels. Excuse me, budget and mid scale as segments. That th these are global players, and uh, they believe that th they will be able to get it through without a problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll touch on the kind of dynamics at play in the mid-scale segment a little bit later on. But 
perhaps let's talk a little bit more about valuation. And I, I'll direct this to you, Alan. Um, so Choice's latest valuation of Wyndham, though that has, of course, been rejected, that valuation was at $9.8 billion, which on an EV EBITDA multiple is at a premium to what Wyndham currently trades at. But interestingly, it's also at a premium to companies like Accor and Hyatt. And their proposed stock price of $90, as you talked about in your introduction, is much higher than the $69 that Wyndham was trading at only yesterday. So does this suggest that even Choice can see that Wyndham is undervalued? Is that why Wyndham has rejected their offer, because they feel like they could get a little bit more from Choice? Or do you think fundamentally that they're never going to accept and that we're just kind of following a a, a race that's never really going to materialize? Well, you know, if I knew the answers to that, I would actually try to get hired as their investment bankers. Because <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that looks at this deal, you know, going back to when this thing first started and kind of looks at this and says, you know, what is the obsession that Choice seems to have with Windows? And and it is borderline. It is borderline obsession because, you know, a company, whenever you're doing a deal, if a company just comes right out and says, I don't want anything to do with you and, and you know, go away, you don't come back a few weeks later with another offer. OK, so now this is the second or third time that Wyndham has kind of said no to them and they're still coming at them. So in Choice's mind, I'm sure they have something here that they believe bigger is better and they need to do this. At the same time, they also know that there's really not a lot of other companies out there for Wyndham. And I don't really want to say Wyndham put themselves in this situation, but when you think about the old Wyndham, when it was Wyndham with also the, the timeshare company, Travel and Leisure, they never had an issue of their stock being undervalued. It was just every single quarter, the stock went up a little bit more. They had this cash flow. They were buying back tons of stock and they seem to have lost that. So their stock has been stagnating. Choice, I think, has traded much better than Wyndham in the last year. So I think they believe they have strength here. I don't think they expected Wyndham's board to just slam the door in their face with a $90 a share offer, not when your stock's trading at $69 and really not doing much. So, you know, I think everyone has a price. So, uh, you know, I think, I don't think this is over. I think Choice may have backed themselves into a corner with their best and final offer. Doesn't mean they can't tweak it, you know, but for right now, I think that Wyndham is going to hold off on this with the things that they put in their rejection, uh, including something that hasn't really been discussed. And they did say something about the combined debt levels, which I think is really interesting because both of these companies throw off a lot of cash flow. And I just didn't think I would hear them say, well, we're concerned about debt levels when these are two basically franchisees who, you know, franchisers that just throw off a lot of cash flow. So I think right now, um, the ball, I think, is in Choice's court because they have to decide if they want to go proxy battle here. I think Wyndham is just going to sit here for now and... If the stock goes back down into the 60s, I think it plays in Choice's favor. If the stock stays around 75, well, then I think we're kind of at a standstill and we have to wait to see what, what happens next. Can you very briefly explain what a proxy battle is? Okay, so if they decide that they're going to the shareholders, and this is something I got to tell you, I have not seen in a very, very long time because... Proxy battles kind of went by the wayside. So there's two types of proxy battles. There's proxy battles if you want somebody on the board. So let's say an activist comes in there and says, I don't like the way the company's being run. I want three of my people on the board. I'm going to submit them and I'm going to do my own proxy, which is the annual meeting to, uh, to vote. They submit their own proxy and they try to get the majority so that they can get their people on. Now, if you want to take over a company, you can do things like tender offers or in a proxy battle, just basically take it to the shareholders and say, we need a majority here to, uh, to say you want $90 a share in, right. in stock. 
Hey, it's Jeff listeners. Hear about the latest trends in the travel industry with the brand USA Talks Travel Podcast. Right now, listen to special live from IPW interviews featuring U.S. Travel's Jeff Freeman. DMOs are at the heartbeat of U.S. Travel. Liz Bittner from Travel South. A lot of key gateway markets are back. L.A. Tourism's Adam Burke. We all win when we all partner together. Plus, brand USA's Stacey Melman and Jackie Ennis with international travel trends and Chris Thompson's farewell finale. I'm Mark Flapitas. Join us for brand USA Talks Travel on your favorite podcast platform. Brand USA Talks Travel. Speaking about the shareholders, do we have a sense for what choices shareholders think about all this? I mean, this is very, this is large scale M&A. And is such, such M&A really the correct use of cash in the current environment when instead perhaps choice should be prioritizing share buybacks or increased dividend payments? Why are they doing such large scale M&A? Well, I mean, both of these companies, Choice and Wyndham, have have really, you know, passive shareholders. You don't hear a lot. You don't even the analysts. The analysts are the same way. There's the analysts either love or hate Choice. The majority of the analysts love Wyndham. They always have. So if the analysts aren't going to stir the pot here, the shareholders aren't going to. Now, that being said, <laughs> the last time this was. This was brought up. Wyndham stock spiked. Nothing came of it. And the stock went all the way down, in fact, lower than it was before the news came out that Choice was making an overture to buy, to buy Wyndham. If that happens again, you always got to think there's going to be activists out there. There's going to be analysts right. starting to push the issue. Because remember, this is not a good year in the stock market. So... Somebody who has a really big position in Wyndham would kind of like the end of end the year at ninety dollars, you know, in, the, in their stake. They don't want to be at sixty five or something like that. So, you know, I think the analysts may lead this right now. I can tell you what they did this morning. So, the analysts that are bullish on Wyndham, they loved it. They think this is a deal that Wyndham should consider. I don't think they're going to go against them because. Wyndham has a very, very good relationship with analysts and with Wall Street. Choice has had a, I guess, a, a love-hate type of thing there. So I think they're kind of sitting there and eventually they're going to start talking about, well, are you going to raise the offer? And then again, as I said, I think Choice made a mistake with their best and final offer because I think they kind of back, they backed themselves into a corner by saying that, but at the same time, Clearly, they want to get this deal done. So, what happens next? I mean, do you I think, think do you think that ninety dollars share price is the ceiling, or could could we see them raise them more? Well, very briefly, yeah. If they can come up with money, they could raise the cash side and get rid of Wyndham's concerns about the share price. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't blame Wyndham. I mean, when you have forty five percent of the deal in stock, okay. Your shareholder, I think it's choice is going to have 65% of the combined companies. You have to be a little bit concerned. And it's, and especially if you have experienced people on the board that are, have been involved in M&A in the past and stuff like that. So I think they have a legitimate concern there. I don't know in this environment with interest rates the way they are, if choice wants to take on further debt. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's a very good segue to ask the very important question, which is why now? You know, it's rare to see such large M and A deals in hotels to begin with, but it's even rarer given the current interest rate environment, the current macro environment. You said this has not been a good year for stocks. Um, Sean, perhaps I'll, I'll ask this to you: Is Choice on an acquisition rush? I mean, it acquired Radisson Americas. Uh, uh, last year, and it's you know trying to go after Wyndham now. Clearly, why now? Why are they doing this now? So, I think a couple of things. I agree with you. It's rare to see such large deals right now because uh, interest rates have because they have risen. That that has led people to to sort of hold off and doing deals in the hope that will it will the rates stabilize? Will it will it get better some months from now? And so, while people are waiting, that's put a deals on hold. In this case, this is being sort of funded out of free cash flow from essentially and uh, along with uh, bets on share price. Um, I guess the first, I, let me give, let me quote from 
Choice Hotels president and CEO himself, and then I'll give my commentary. I mean, on CNBC earlier today, he said that costs for our franchisees are rising. By bringing the two companies together, we believe that direct bookings, lower operating costs, and a much more robust rewards program, um, we have an opportunity to help the owners, our franchisees, really improve the value of their assets and their return on investment. Um, and so this, as, as Alan sort of summed it up, bigger is better. There is this sense that they will get not a whole lot on synergies in terms of costs, but I think it's much more about the play that they are being able to cut out the middleman, get a bet, better negotiating, better terms and how they deal with the online travel agencies for commission costs and also just by having a more robust loyalty program, uh, you'll because they'll have more of a footprint, road warriors traveling will have less reason to book outside of the system. They'll be more likely to do direct bookings, which will cut their uh, commission costs. Um, so, but why now? I think one aspect that we forget about sometimes is that there are personalities involved. Um, yes, at a certain point to what Alan was saying, there is a fiduciary duty to uh, that boards have to their shareholders. If th this offer right now is, you know, at a multiple that that Wyndham has never enjoyed over its earnings before in, in, multiple, in, in past years, if if as Alan says, you can shift it back to a little bit more cash and a little bit less dependent on stock, um, I think it's it'll be very hard for the Wyndham share Wyndham shareholders. I could see starting to get very pressured, or an activist could come in and 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 try to go goad things. So I do think uh, in terms of personalities, this is a hard push. And one reason it's a, I feel like it's an aggressive play that is that um, uh, Pat's team of choice, they never signed a mutual uh, uh, a disclosure agreement in order to allow, you know, open up the kimono, as they say, to let Wyndham's team look at the books. They, they haven't completely been forthcoming. They sort of went went right to their trump card and threw it down on the table um and so i think this partly reflects personalities uh on both sides um i'd say um choice president and ceo patrick patius seems to have a drive to be a bit of a swashbuckling deal maker uh he's you know, <laughs> yeah. you know he's he joined choice in 2005 and he's risen fast by um, trying to do acquisitions um in 2018 they had the wood spring suites which nearly tripled their their position in extended stay. And then the Radisson deal uh, ex added the, added nine brands as the most ex significant transaction in their history. And so I, I think sometimes ego, so to speak, does play a role in how people go about the deals. Uh, it's not that in the end, everyone involved has to make sure that the numbers work out. But I think the reason this has become a hostile uh, bid is because um, uh, and why it is why now to get back to your question is is because of the temperaments of the people on on, on both sides. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think it's easy to forget about the psychology of what's involved and just look at the EBITDA multiple, which I'm I think I can be I am at fault for that sometimes. Um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about the synergies. You mentioned this in your comments just now. Um, the press release mentioned that if there was an acquisition, there would be $150 million of synergies. Both these companies are, are the leaders in mid-scale, as we've already discussed. So that kind of begs the question, are there really synergies to be had if both companies have fairly similar, uh, similar chain scale mix? Um, and if they kind of merge, what, won't there be kind of cannibalization of the existing estate? So I'll... I'll go first and then Alan, if you have some thoughts. Um, so I think the, you raised a couple of interesting points about the synergies here. You know, when this was first put about uh, as uh, back in May, uh, David Katz at Jefferies as an analyst, he estimated there'd be about $100 million in savings through operational synergies. Now, to Choice's credit, uh, Choice, when it made an acquisition bid for Radisson Americas, it put out a bunch of projections about what the savings were going to be. It has met all the timetables. Everything that's, it has said that would, it would happen with Radisson has happened on the timetable early in advance. And so it has kept its word on that. So this is the same management team now. So do credit to them there. But it is, you know, this press release said 150 million. Uh, they, Choices Hotels Management told Truist Securities today that it could be as high as 210 million. 
And it does raise the question of how, where, where would the savings sort of come from? Because uh, as Alan mentioned, Wyndham is praised by analysts for being a very well-managed company. Uh, it doesn't seem, they, they went public in 2018. They've had a lot of opportunity to sort of like work through some of the low-hanging fruit of uh, squeezing out costs out of the system. Um, so I don't, without, and especially since both sides haven't really exchanged, really let each side look at the books in detail, I think it's it's a bit of a an assumption that um, Choice is making about what the potential cost synergies would be. Again, to their credit, they did they did successfully do it in Radisson. They did a good job in Woodspring. So maybe they'll do it again. Uh, Sean, do you want to add? Yeah. Yeah, Sean's correct that I mean, when a company does it previously, you tend to believe them a little bit more next time. That being said, the analysts are not in agreement on this that they're going to get to 150 million in synergies. One thing I think that nobody's really talking about is you have two very large public companies here. Removing the public costs out of one and merging it into the other is a big cost savings. Obviously, it's not going to be $150 million. But when you start thinking about things like that, you got accounting costs, you've got um, SEC costs, you have regulatory, and then start going down the line on how many things Wyndham and Choice have that overlap. Again, this is, we're all going to speculate because nobody knows because Choice is basically saying, we did this before, you should believe us now. So as Sean said, they did it with Radisson. So what, why should we not believe it? Well, I mean, I guess we go down the line. This, I didn't see Wyndham say, I don't want to do this deal because we don't think there's going to be $150 million in synergy. So right. I don't think it's not there. I don't, you know, again, 150 million, 200 million in this environment with costs the way they are and everything. It's going to be tough, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to question them. Not, at, not since they've done it before. They, I'm sure they didn't pull that just out of thin air. So they must have something, some substance behind that. Yeah. I mean, okay. Say, say there are $150 million of synergy, but I'm struggling to kind of get my head around the contradicting messages that we hear on the uh, earnings calls. Uh, where management of both companies have talked about expanding into more upscale properties kind of as a means to address the white space in their portfolios. And we've seen that happen with Hilton Marriott expanding the other way into mid-scale um, to kind of uh, broaden broaden their, their portfolio. Um, by acquiring a company that has, you know, is, is also a leader in mid-scale, isn't that contradicting the strategy they've set on the earnings calls? And what's next? Are we going to see choice now acquire a luxury brand after this it seems a little bit kind of sporadic and ad hoc and i'm a little bit unsure about what their real strategy is and i wonder if that's going to negatively impact the stock price further well i mean i'll take i'll take this one you know i like the saying stay in your lane (laughs) so it's kind of like you know here's two companies that are very good at what they do i mean i'm not going to tell you that I would stay in a Super 8, but plenty of people do. My older son stays in them and everything else because they're cheap and stuff. So when he's out and everything, but, you know, we get back to what you asked before. Why now? (laughs) And I keep coming back to, you know, does this have something to do with Hilton? Does this have something to do with Marriott, Hilton Hyatt, and all the other guys kind of moving down a little bit? moving, you know, all right, we were in luxury, we've been there, we're not really adding much to that now, but we're going to start lowering the bar a little bit and kind of infringing on their territory. This yeah. is the kind of thing that you need a conference call. You need choice <laughs> Yes, Wyndham. perhaps you will see that, yeah. <laughs> you need choice or Wyndham to come in there and say, this is why I want to do this deal, okay? It's not I, like, it's not like, somebody else is going to steal their thunder outside of private equity. I mean, there really isn't anybody in the market that I think would say, all right, I'm going to top this deal. I want Wyndham or I'm just going to turn the tables and I'm just going to buy choice. So I don't think there's anything for them to lose by 
pleading their case. Now, if they go to proxy fight, Choice has to has to explain why they want to do this deal. What what they think is going to happen, they have to explain it in detail because the SEC is never going to approve the proxy, the uh, the uh, registration, other the form, otherwise. So, if we get that far, we're going to know. You know. Yeah, if, sure. You sure, know, I think if, you had some we don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So I think the two the, the two sides of it is that, as you were saying, Panavi, in the, on the most recent earnings calls, again and again, Choices Management Team has said we want to move up into more revenue intense segments. We want to go up from economy and we want to go more global. And then they've gone and made a big merger offer with one of the most budget and mid-scale intense and North America intense companies that they could possibly pick. So I feel like analysts are justified in saying like, okay, well, how can we take your company strategy statements as seriously in, in, in these earnings calls if you're, you know, I, I suppose the, the retort was, this is such a great deal. We needed to have sort of a faint uh, look one way while we were trying to do something else. And if that's the argument, they would say, possibly they would point to, you know, what happened at Skip Global Forum, which is we had the CEO of Hilton say that the biggest uh, 10 and 20 year opportunity for the hotel sector in general is in the mid tier, which is not that people are going to stop building luxury hotels by any means. It's just that the the, the most opportunity on a, a you know, the, one of the most profitable hotels that you can have are these hotels that are in the mid scale, the residence inns, the, the, the higher end, La Quintas, uh, the, the uh, Hampton Inns. And so uh, that is as the middle class develops worldwide, this is sort of a model. And in order for the choice and Wyndham both need to get out of North America, where the opportunities for net unit expansion are shrinking, it's pretty saturated along most of the roadsides. So in order to grow, they need to sort of grow out. And also for their loyalty programs, they need to um, grow up to have more interesting redemption options to make their loyalty programs interesting. So um, I agree with you. I think there's a, you know, you said it better than I did, Pranavia, and also you touched on this in your report for Skift Research. It's that it's, um, they're, they're, they have a lot of overlap in the Venn diagram and you can make a pro or con argument about whether they're better together. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, this is a story that is not going to stay static, it's ever evolving, and we at Skift are going to, you know, make sure that we cover it with keen interest. But I think we're at the top of our time here. So thanks, Sean, and thanks, Alan, for your insightful comments. Thanks, Pranavi. Thank you. This has been the Skift Podcast. Thank you for listening.